<laughs> Welcome everyone. <laughs> uh, let's all stand and get ready to worship our God. Right, let's, let's pray. Dear Lord, I pray that, that we just have an embrace tonight, Lord, of your love, God. I pray that we can just be dear Lord and be good stewards into your love, Lord, and to just lift you up for all that you've done, Lord. I pray, Lord, that, that as your as your children still come, Lord, that, that we just be together in unison right now, Lord. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Go ahead and have a seat, grab your Bibles, and open up to Exodus chapter 19. The only announcement that I have tonight is our Christmas service this coming Sunday. So, some of you that are on Facebook, and I, as I look out there, I know at least three of you that are on there, and others that are watching from, from home. Uh, please go to the event page, and you see our event for this Christmas at 9.30 a.m. here at the church, and share that with your friends. Put it on your wall. Share it to uh, pages that you go to <coughs> quite often that people know you. So get the word out that we'll be here this coming Sunday at 9.30. We'll have a special reading from a book that we read from every year about the story of the birth of Christ, and then um, special worship that the group has put together for that day, and then a special message uh, dealing with our Savior's birth. Are we still having a Sunday morning service? Yeah. There is Sunday morning. morning. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's what he just said. Oh, nice what you're saying. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there is no Christmas service uh, here, so because they're just so close, so, yeah. <clears throat> so no, no, mon don't come Monday. The gates will be closed. <laughs> so. All right. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and pray and we'll get into today's word. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercies, Lord, fresh and new every morning, Lord. Thank you for your beautiful word that we're about to get into and, and hopefully learn some things about you, Lord. Lord, we do want to pray for those that are hurting right now, Lord. I don't want to lift them up to you, Father. I ask that you would heal the broken hearts, Lord. We pray for those that are sick. Father, in this church, uh, this chest and cough and fever uh, virus has been going around and it's been affecting us all <clears throat> here for the past month, Lord. And so we're just praying for healing, uh, Father, and that you would just uh, get us well so that we can uh, join once again in the fellowship of Calvary Chapel here, Lord. Now, Lord, just minister to us through your word. May you uh, bring truth, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, open your Bible. 
Bibles to Exodus chapter 19. Chapter 19. <clears throat> and this evening's theme is the voice of God. The voice of God. How many times have you heard someone say, have you ever heard the voice of God? And my answer to that is not audibly, but I have heard God's moving in my life and in my spirit directing me. We find in this chapter of Exodus, God speaks audibly here to his servants, to his people, which happens very rarely, but they will literally hear the voice of God. And more, more, than, um, more often than not, <clears throat> God usually speaks to his people through an inner conviction uh, as he's leading them. Hebrews 1.1 1, 1 says, God at various times and in various ways spoken in times past through the fathers by the prophets has in these last days spoken to us through his son. And so today, today he speaks through us through his son, Jesus Christ, who is written in the Gospels and in the New Testament. And so we get our, our direction and uh, move from the Lord that way. So this is a very important chapter of Exodus chapter 19 as we actually uh, watch God speak to his people. And that's, that's exciting, at least for me and me Bible students. So the context here in chapter 19 brings us to Mount Sinai. Now we may know the story of Moses, the movie, and the Exodus, and how God moved them out of Egypt and then brought them to Sinai, where eventually we we know this story because it's just part of the movie. They build this golden calf, you know, and then God comes down and Moses throws the commandments and, and judges them. <clears throat> well, they're there at Mount Sinai in chapter 19. They finally arrived. He, the, Israel has stopped six times uh, before they got to Sinai, but this is where God wanted them to be and ordained them to be so that he can prepare them for the promised land. So they have spent a year at the mountain being equipped for the work that God has for them. And as we read the story, obviously that generation failed God, and God had to raise up a whole new generation to go into the promised land. The scene at Mount Sinai is one of the most significant in history of the world, for it was there where God speaks to Moses audibly, and the people get to hear God's voice. And so, three points this morning. One, eagle's wings. We're going to talk about how the Lord has eagle's wings and how he carries us upon those eagle's wings. Boundaries. Second point, boundaries. We all have boundaries. And God gave boundaries to the children of Israel at this time <clears throat> below the mountain there. And then we're going to talk about the priest. So let's go ahead and read the text. In verse 1 and 2, we see the children of Israel camped at the bottom of the mountain there of Mount Sinai. It says, in the third month, after the children of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on the same day they came to the wilderness of Sinai. Now since leaving Egypt, it's taken them three months of trying faith to arrive to Mount Sinai. They've been through a lot just to get to this point. Uh, they definitely have persevered. Uh, they have struggled in their faith, not always trusting God, not always putting their faith in Him, uh, and confronting leadership, confronting God himself, but they made it. It was tribal, but they made it. They saw God's deliverance from Egypt, received his guidance on the way uh, to go. They saw his glorious parting of the Red Sea. They saw God provide food, uh, manna from heaven, water miraculously coming out of a rock. They saw, prayerfully, prayer, they saw a prayerfully victory over the Amalekites. They've seen a lot. And we will not see them move from this spot until Numbers chapter 10. So they'll spend a year here. And verse 2 says, For they had departed from Rephidim, had come to the wilderness of Sinai, and camped in the wilderness. So Israel camped there before the mountain. So Israel will camp at this foot of the mountain. Sinai was the place where Moses had his burning bush experience with God. And now the whole nation of Israel will soon experience what Moses experienced at that mountain. In verse 3 and 6, God instructs Moses. Moses went up to God, there at Mount Sinai, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob. 
and tell the children of Israel. So Moses knows this mountain. So he went up to speak with God. God calls him and speaks to the house of Jacob. He asked Moses to speak to the house of Jacob for him. Now, why did God use the house of Jacob? Why did he just say to the children of Israel? But he puts this phrase into the house of Jacob. This title Jacob associates the nation of Israel with the weakest and most carnal patriot, Jacob. And so God's view at this point is that they're acting more like Jacob instead of acting like Abraham and Isaac. And they, as I said, they had a, a, a rough trip getting there. It's been testing their flesh and their faith. And it seemed like they gave into their flesh more than their faith. And so God says, house of Jacob here for a reason. Verse 4, he says, you, shall, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. So Moses is to remind them how God carried them through the exodus of Egypt like an eagle carries her young on her wings. And so let's talk about that because it's an interesting story. God is using an analogy that the Israelites are well aware. They see it all the time. With eagles soaring over their heads, probably there in Mount Sinai, found a cliff in the rocks very high. The eagles would nest there and they would reproduce themselves. And so the children of Israel knew exactly what he was saying. Possibly Moses said, like eagles' wings as you see them flying around us at this moment. And God's love and care was shown for Israel already as he bore them on eagles' wings. Now, this destiny was based on what God already did for them in the great deliverance from Egypt. It is said that eagles, uh, that an eagle does not carry her young with her claws like other birds. But the young eagles attach themselves on the back of the mother eagle and are protected as they are carried by the mother. So if a predator came, the mother had his, her claws ready to attack or to defend. If there was someone trying to shoot an arrow at the eagle, like a hunter, that arrow would hit the mother eagle before it would hit the young eagles on the back, thus protecting them. The first thing the children of Israel were to do in preparation uh, to receive the law was to remember how God delivered them like a mother delivers its young. Remember how God set you free, Moses said, from your bondage in Egypt. And how important is that, that we always remember what the Lord has done for us. Because the Lord has bore us many times on eagles' wings, has he not? He has been there for us. He has protected us. He has helped us through life situations. Nothing else can help us uh, like the Lord can help us. It is amazing how we turn to all kinds of different things like psychology and, and uh, worldly wisdom. Now, you might say, well, what's wrong with psychology? Well, I don't know if you've ever been to a psychologist or to a counselor, but they don't have much wisdom <laughs> themselves. Oftentimes, and I've been to many of them, Oftentimes, they'll just ask you questions like, well, how do you feel? Well, I feel this way. Well, why do you feel that way? Oh, well, because this and this. Oh, and you think that's okay? Oh, well, no. Okay, then. So what do you need to change? Oh, well, probably this. Oh, wonderful. So change that. We'll see you next week, and we'll charge you $200 for that session. <clears throat> you know, basically, it's all that they really, because they really don't have the answers. They study human behavior. Uh, they try to get the best answers they can. They, they, you know, read the books from Freud and other psychologists, and they pass along their information. But it's the Lord that has the answers. Not only does he have the answers, he has the solutions and the, and the power to follow through on those solutions. Only the Lord can truly deliver us. Uh, not man, definitely. This doesn't work. And you find yourself at the end going, why did I go to that session for all those years? And it really hasn't changed anything. So we need to remember how the Lord has bore us. Let me share a story with you on how an eagle protects and how an eagle trains and bears her children on, in the nest. The usually, usually an eagle, after selecting a site somewhere high in the mountains, a mother would build her nest there. And as the newly hatched eaglets begin to grow and they're comfortable in their nest, comfortable in that protection, one day the mother 
will all of a sudden turn over the nest up in the cliffs of the rocks. And those little eagles will go tumbling down, straight down the cliff, screaming and yelling, and they'll be falling and falling and falling, and right before they hit the ground, the mother eagle comes and swoops right under them and lifts them up. And then brings them back to the nest and lays them back in the nest. And then she'll do this several times, um, possibly seven times. And one day she'll turn the nest over and the eagle will fall out and then the eagle all of a sudden starts flying and soaring. And now the mother no longer has to bear them on her wings. They've learned, they've been protected, they've been trained to do a wonderful thing, fly around and soar like a beautiful eagle does. <clears throat> and that is why the Lord bore you because he loves you. He wants to train you. He wants to equip you. He wants you to have the confidence so that he will lead you and guide you. And that's the deliverance. Uh, I bore you on eagle's wings that he's sharing with Israel. Uh, also was for the fellowship because he said in that verse to what? To bring them to himself, right? God didn't deliver Israel <clears throat> so they could do their own little thing, right? God didn't save us so that we can just do our own thing or continue to do our own thing. God saved us for a purpose. <clears throat> he saved us to be his people, to have a relationship. And by the way, that's the first thing he wants to do in our lives, is have a personal relationship with you before you do anything else. He's more interested in you sitting down with him and having a personal relationship before you go out and even serve, before you give, before you support uh, before you do anything, God wants you to know that he loves you, he cares about you, and, and he really does want you to experience that intimacy, that koinonia that he has for you, so that when it does get tough, when it does get hard in life, you can come and just sit at his feet and know, okay, Lord, you're going to set everything okay, you promised, I'm going to just lay it before you and just pray that it will happen. I love it when I read prayers <clears throat> and uh, when I read struggles, and then as they're sharing their struggles, they say, Lord, you're faithful to give me the strength that I need to get through the struggle. And I'm thinking, right on. They, they've got it. Instead of just saying the struggles and then saying there's no hope. But they have hope in Jesus. And I think that's why communion is so important, right? Because we do create an intimacy and a relationship with the Lord. Look at verse 5. Now, therefore... If you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. So Israel was to obey the voice of the Lord and keep Abraham's covenant that God made with him and to separate themselves as his special treasure, his personal people. God said, you are my personal treasure. Treasure. That's how he views us. We're valuable to him. A treasure is worth something. And usually treasures, everybody wants it. But the person that owns it is the one that's blessed by it. And so God is saying that Israel is his own special treasure. Meaning, meaning that they belong privately to him as a king. And this implies special value as well as special relationship. Um, the added word people there that Moses makes or God makes to Moses is to make the meaning still clear that they are a people that are separated unto God. And God in, intended for Israel to be that special treasure. Now he wanted them to be people with, with a unique place in God's great plan. A people of great value and concern to God. And so this is why God has chosen them because they're the least of people and they're going to be a part of a great plan so that when this plan is unfolded, people will look at them and say, how did they do that? They could not do it alone. They must have had the help of God himself. And you see that throughout their journey through the land of Canaan. Paul longed for Christians to know how great of a treasure they are to God. And he prayed that they would know what are the riches and glory of his inheritance in the saints in Ephesians 1.8. And that believers would know that they also are a part of a great plan of God. And if they would seek God with their whole hearts, God would reveal that plan to them. 
So he goes on in verse 6, you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel, God said. Peter picks up on this same analogy when he calls us, the church, a royal priesthood in 1 Peter 2.9. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into the marvelous light. We too are a treasure to the Lord. We are a royal priesthood. Uh, we are a special people, he said in 1 Peter 2.9. And this all speaks of having a personal relationship with God without any priest or mediator that would get us to God, that we ourselves can come boldly to the throne room of God. And that is good news. So God intended for Israel to be a kingdom of priests where every believer could come before God themselves and everyone could represent God to the nations. He also calls them a holy nation which means primarily a nation that is set apart from all other nations. So he didn't say you are a nation like other nations. He's saying you are a holy nation from other nations. You are set apart. That's what holiness means. You're holy. You're set apart and you're set apart unto me because you're always set apart from something to something. And you are set apart from the world to God to have that Relationship. So God intended for Israel to be a holy nation, a nation and, and a people set apart for the rest of the world, from the rest of the world, uh, the particular possession to God, which would fit his purpose. So Moses then instructs the children exactly as God had commanded, verse 7. So Moses came and called for the elders of the people. He laid before them all these words which the Lord commanded him. Then all the people answered together and said, what? No, we're not going to do that. No, they said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Sounds like Peter, right? Lord, we will never deny you. We'll die for you all the way to the end. Be careful when we, we, we start speaking like this. I, you know, I've fallen into this trap. Oh, no, I would never. And then all of a sudden you're tested in that, which you said you would never. We need to be careful that, you know, both because you obviously see the track history of Israel, right? Have they really been obedient to the Lord? <laughs> Not really. And now all of a sudden, oh Lord, everything you said we're going to do, we promise. No, this is it. We're, we're living a changed life, Lord. Oh yeah, we've been born again now, Lord. No, we're going to do everything you said. So Moses brought back the words of the people to the Lord. Uh, so the people you know, pretty much responded to Moses as a mediator. And Moses, you're going to see, is going back up and then down and back up and then down and then back up and, and back down. That's tedious. That's hard work. I, I am sure, I am truly glad that call, God called me in the New Testament era instead of the Old Testament to be a priest because I'd be having to do a lot more work if I was a priest at that time. Sacrifices every day, cleaning the temple. It must have been tedious. And now we don't necessarily have to do uh, those things because we now have a mediator through Jesus Christ. So Moses climbs up the mountain, then he climbs back down, he talks to the people, and then he goes back up and he talks to the Lord. In verse 9, the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I come to you in the thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with you and believe you forever. So Moses told the words of the people to the Lord. You know, those that believe that the Bible is not the word of God, and most uh, not most, but a, a lot of theologians will say that the Old Testament is really not a historical document. It's, it's more of metaphors uh, that the children of Israel wrote to, uh, to give us types of different moral values and lessons and things like that. But you read something like this, where, where God says, look, I'm literally going to speak to you, Moses, in an audible voice so that the people hear me and they know that I am speaking to you forever, that they may believe. That's clear cut. I'm going to speak to you. They're going to hear me, and they're going to believe forever that I spoke to you. That's not met speaking metaphorically. Uh, that's very clear that the Lord is going to speak to them. Now, I wonder what he sounded like, right? Because we get these voices, you know, 
they, they're holy, so there's got to be deep and those Moses, you know, we, we watch the movies. Why couldn't it just be Moses? Yeah. Why can't it be normal voice, you know? We come up with all, we don't know what his voice sounded like. I'm sure it was very clear, Hebrew. You know, we know it was probably Hebrew. Well, maybe we don't know it was Hebrew. Who knows? He, I'm sure he's, God speaks all languages, you know, but he probably spoke to them, Aramaic, <laughs> Hebrew, uh, whatever they needed to hear, and he spoke to them, and they heard them. Moses obviously heard them face to face. He had heard him before, so he was accustomed to hearing the voice of God. Uh, it wasn't too fearful. Here it's going to be fearful that because of the thunder and the lightning and the cloud, but there's another place where the Bible says that, that God's, God is not in the thunder, God is not in the lightning, but he's a small, still voice. Now, a small, still voice means gentle, right? Lowly. You know, Moses, Moses, tell my people that there's a treasure for me, that I love them, and they're a whole nation. You know, I can almost picture God doing it that way, being totally in love with them. So Moses then is to consecrate the people and to prepare them to hear God. Verse 10, Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothes. So God instructs Moses to set the people apart within two days. The word consecration means set them apart, make them holy, wash their clothes, prepare yourself, brush your teeth, comb your hair, put on your best Sunday suit because we're going to go meet God. That's what God is saying here. They are to clean themselves to meet the Lord. And God is going to appear to Israel in the glorious cloud that he's going to send with his presence. And verse 11 says, Let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day the Lord will come down upon Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. So God wants them ready by the third day. And then he will appear at the foot of the mountain in Sinai to the people. And you shall set boundaries for the people all around, saying, Take heed to yourselves, that you do not go up to the mountain or touch the base of the mountain. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. Wow, now that's a little scary, right? Moses was to set up clear boundaries all around the base of the mountain. <clears throat> I don't know if they put rocks, you know, or cones, you know, something like that around. Says, Look, here's the boundaries here. People don't go beyond these lines. Don't touch the mountain. At least cut, kill you. I don't say murder, but kill. Because his intention is not to. But if they get too close, uh, he has to because they're unholy. So the coming of God to Mount Sinai does not mean the people were free just to go to the mountain and, and fellowship with God just flippantly. <clears throat> I think that's something we've lost, right? Our society, um, my mom and I were just speaking about that on the way over, it's, it's so different. It's just so different. Um, just listening to some of the youth, some of the riots that are going on. Uh, they've interviewed some young college students, you know, how they don't like this political thing or that political thing and, and so forth. And <clears throat> just a lot of the, the shows that we see. And I asked my mom, I said, Mom, did I ever raise my voice to my dad? Or my brother? She goes, no. Well, did we ever disagree with them and tell them you don't know what you're talking about? No. And, and I'm trying to remember, I said, I don't think I ever even thought of, of even saying something against him. I may have thought you don't know what you're talking about or, or, or I don't agree, but I never vocalized it. And today, you're so dumb, Dad. You didn't even go to school. You know Google says this. And kids are so bold now to disrespect their parents completely. You know, and the Bible does say that we are to honor our father and mothers. And if we don't, then we won't live a long life. And that's something to consider. We've lost that reverence to God, that God is holy. And, and, and it's interesting because sometimes you'll read commentaries or, or, or just comments or even quotes and they'll make references to God like he's a he's a, a rapper or something. You know, the man upstairs, you know. You know, he's got all the cool things, you know, and stuff like just so disrespectful, not with honor, not with reverence. The word reverence means holy, pure, and you approach him that way. 
I'm not saying that you need to put on an angel suit and have the whole whole outfit. You know, I'm just saying you speak with him with reverence and respect and honor. And we just don't do that anymore. And so God is showing us, I'm holy. You cross the line and you're gone. Now, this is the Old Testament. We are living under grace. Thanks be to God to Jesus. And, and to those young kids that can voice their opinions um, and slander their dads and, and say those things to them face to face. You know, even just to have the, the guts to stand up in front of your dad and start yelling and screaming at him, I think that's totally disrespectful. Totally disrespectful. And that's sad because I never would have done that but that's the day and age that we're living in now. That children have been taught through these liberals that they have a right to voice their opinions because they're valuable. And yet, they came out of some slimy goop as they evolved out of the water. You know, so confusing, I'm sure. And it's, a lot of it is not necessarily their fault, but they've been indoctrinated in the lies. <clears throat> so set up the boundaries, Moses. Not a hand shall touch him. But he shall surely be stoned or shot with an arrow. Whether a man or a beast, he shall not live. When the trumpet sounds long, they shall come near the mountain. So they had to keep their distance behind these barriers. And the penalty for failing to keep their distance was death. If a man or even an animal failed to obey, they were to be stoned or take an arrow and shoot him and kill him. Any person or animal killed for getting too close would be regarded as so unholy that they could not even be touched later on. God sets up boundaries. He's setting up a boundary here. Here's the boundary line. Don't go past it. If there is anything basic to human nature, and I think we all know this, it is that we have boundaries. We have boundaries. We live under boundaries. If you are in a some sort of garden that grows roses and grass and greenery and shrubs, and there's a sign that says, do not walk on the grass, that's a boundary right there. It's telling you, we purposely take care of this grass so that it looks beautiful, so that it's a reflection of the flowers and the things around us. And if you walk on it, you destroy what we put so much money in to maintain. The people come along and say, oh, stupid fool, let me just walk on it. <laughs> what are you going to do? And they don't do anything because they really can't do anything. To them. You almost want to just grab them by the ear and then go over there and give them a good swap. I think we lost that. That was my mom. My mom was saying, saying oh, no, no, you would never do that to dad because he'd slap you right in the face. I'm like, you're right. <laughs> he would have just whacked. We just don't do that. So we all have boundaries. And setting these boundaries and providing the death penalty for breaching them, God showed Israel that obedience is more important than their feelings. Right? Can you imagine if God did that today? Here's the boundaries. Don't come to the mountain. Oh, that's so unfair, God. That is so unfair. Why are you so mean? We haven't done anything to you, you should allow us to tear down the wall. What is wrong with coming to your side and enjoying your presence? This is not right. You can see liberal kids doing things like that, you know? I'm going to sue you. I'm taking you to court, and we're going to settle this in court, and I'm going to win. Remember that when parents were being sued by their children? <clears throat> this is what the liberals have done. <clears throat> now, I am sure that there was some bold Israelite that felt like, what boundaries are you talking about? I don't need no stinking boundaries, you know? And so they decide, well, I'm just going to go by my feelings. I want to go over to that side and see what happens. And boom, they go over to the side and God strikes them dead. Or some soldier or guard pulls the arrow and shoots them right through. The people could only come near to God by invitation. And when the trumpet signaled, the invitation was open. We all needed to find, understand, and keep within our boundaries. A boundary is a dividing line. In geography, a boundary is that which marks the end of one property or the jurisdiction of and the beginning of another, right? Do not pass. 
You are trespassing on someone else's property. So what does that mean? That's the boundary line. You don't go on that side. That's the law. You don't come onto my property either unless you're invited to my property. In, per, in interpersonal relationships, a boundary is what divides one person from another. As here, God is dividing humanity from his presence. So that each can be have separate identities, responsibilities, and privileges. We have boundaries in humanity. Because we all have different uh, privileges. And you know, a handicap has certain boundaries. And we that are not handicapped have boundaries. We can't just go park in a handicapped spot. That's illegal. But they do it all the time. Why? Because it's not fair that they get it. Look, I see them just get out of the car and they walk right in. How did they get their little handicap sign? Well, because they're probably able to walk into the store and there. But to walk a distance probably hurts more than being right up at front. But we don't think that way. We just think that's not fair. I'm just parking there. It's just going to be for a little bit. Those spaces are always empty anyway. Who cares? Right? And that's their mentality. But we have those boundaries. And those boundaries are there for a reason. The reasons we have so many heartaches, like relationships, politics, crime, or families, in humanity is we don't keep our boundaries. We really don't keep our boundaries. That's why we go through the things we go through. The things that we struggle because of those boundaries. Biblically speaking, boundaries are related to self-control. Think about it. They really are related to self-control. <clears throat> you know, here's a boundary. <clears throat> we set up stop or we set up stop signs periodically at, at crossways so that we don't have accidents, so we don't kill people. This is the reason why we do this. That is a boundary. We need to have the self-control to not just run the light. But we have youth in our community that just doesn't care and they just run the stop sign. And who cares? They figure they're stopping, so I'm just going to go through and I won't get hit. But people have gotten hit. People have been murdered because of those things. It's really about self-control. The Bible commands us to control ourselves, whereas our human nature desires to control others, right? That's our human nature. And so we're controlling others. We're controlling, we're controlling the court system or the lawmakers that, that said this is a stop sign. Well, we don't care. We're, we're going to tell them we don't like it, and so we're not going to obey it. And you're probably just, you are just saying very clearly that we're controlling the situation and not you. And if left, left unchecked, guys, our nature or our natural desire runs a rough shot over others. It just doesn't care. It just runs right over and destroys people because we don't care. And you see that. Oh, you watch some of these these documentaries and news reports and these young kids and they're saying, yeah, but he's, our president is so corrupt and so evil, I really don't care. And they're screaming and yelling at the top of their lungs. And you're just saying, yes, but he's our president. We should respect the office. No, we should. You know, and they just go on and on and on. Just amazing. Personal boundaries help to limit our selfish inclinations to control or to neglect others. Let me give you some other ideas because I think this is a good good word for us to understand boundaries because we don't think in these terms too often do we because there are boundaries there's boundaries in our relationships in relationships with male female females and females and males and males uh, one boundaries protect us from those who have no self-control and who wish to control us now, there was a time in our country where men and women and children used to work the children would go to work in factories and they'd pay them pennies and they'd make a lot of money. And so they set up boundaries so that those manufacturers, those companies could not take advantage of children who were staying home and going to work so that they could put food on their table, barely. And so they set up laws. And that's why you don't have children working anymore to this day. Boundaries keep out worldly influences, right? Worldly influences are kept out because of boundaries. Well, don't watch that. Don't do that. We can't do those things because they'll influence us. They'll corrupt us. Don't have <clears throat> bad relationships with people that aren't Christians because they're going to corrupt you. These are all boundaries that help us. Boundaries are about taking responsibility for our own lives. 
Boundaries are about living inside God's boundaries, which brings blessings. And living outside of them bring destruction and death. We choose to live inside God's boundaries. We set that boundary up. I've set the boundary that I'm going to live in God's boundary. I'm not going to go outside my boundary. Nor am I going to go outside of God's boundary. Otherwise, it leads me to death. Adam and Eve had one boundary in the Garden of Eden. Imagine that. One boundary. Abstain from the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. That's it. That one tree. Now, how massive was the Garden of Eden? Probably massive. Miles and miles and miles and miles. <clears throat> Imagine all of Riverside being the Garden of Eden. And there's one tree on the corner of Riverside in Ontario, the tree of life, and God has you in the center, and you're going, where's that tree at? You know, and you have all this other territory to enjoy, and you're still, where's that tree at? And you're enjoying everything that God created, but you want to at least just see it. And see, well, we need to see the boundaries so we understand not to eat of it. So can we just see where the boundaries are? And they go over and they say, oh, that tree. Oh, okay. Well, now we know. We're going to stay away. Yeah, right. <laughs> One boundary. That was it. And they couldn't do it. And it brought sin into the world, guys. Imagine the damage. The damage they did by not obeying God. The damage we do to ourselves. A healthy marriage requires boundaries. Marital boundaries keep sex and intimacy within the relationship. We're respecting each other's uh, needs. Boundaries are also helpful in parenting. Setting healthy limits for children, even though limits don't li uh, children don't like it, but it protects them. Unhealthy boundaries tend to control and have selfish motives behind it as a parent who selfishly sets boundaries over their kids so they're not bothered or they're not misused. A person with healthy boundaries takes responsibility for his own life and allows others to live their own. There's a good place for boundaries. And we need to think about some of the boundaries we have. And maybe even some of the boundaries we don't have. We must have boundaries in our lives. Moses now sanctifies the people, verse 14. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people and sanctified the people and washed their clothes just as the Lord had commanded him. And he said to the people, be ready for the third day. Do not come near your wives. Now he's not giving a command here that any time you approach God, you can't come to go have intimacy with your wife here. He's just saying, separate yourself from fleshly desires right now and come and seek me. And then the people go meet God, verse 16 through 18. Then it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders, lightnings, and a thick cloud in the mountain and the sound of the trumpet was very loud, so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked. Can you imagine that? How scary that would have been. Thunders and lightnings and a cloud and a voice and smoke. It's like, oh, yeah, I'm not getting close to that boundary. There's no way that I'm even going to touch it. You know, I'm sure there were others going like this. Oh, oh, I went over, whatever. Yeah. Silly. So God calls Moses to the top of Sinai. And when the blast of the trumpet sounded, long and became louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him by voice. So that blast of the trumpet sounded so long and so hard, and then all of a sudden the people's attention was brought to that mountain, and God spoke by voice to Moses. And the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. Now there goes Moses again. God comes down, Moses goes up. And they're just going back and forth. It took a lot of courage for Moses to go up in the midst of all this thunder and lightning and quake and fire and smoke. But I think that uh, Moses knew God. Uh, not only in terms of his awesome power, definitely, and you see it through the plagues, but also in terms of his graciousness and his kindness, which you see through all of this. 
And so the Lord said to Moses, go down, warn the people, lest they break through to gaze at the Lord, and many of them perish. Also, let the priests who come near the Lord consecrate themselves, lest the Lord break out against them. My third point, and last, and then we'll close up, is we have a phrase here, let the priests, and I know some of you probably caught this, that study your Bible, but the priests did not exist at this time. They didn't come into existence until later when they created the, the Levitical priesthood through Aaron. And so here he uses the word priest. So who are these priests that he's talking about? Because there's no evidence of priests existing in Israel until Mount Sinai. In Exodus chapter 24, it was young men who offered sacrifices. In Exodus 24, 5, not priests. Perhaps the word stands for elders, some think, to whom there has been reference already in 1812, and it's in a religious context. But when you look at the Hebrew word, kohen, it's talking about officiating as a priest, acting as a priest, a chief ruler, a priest, prince, principal, or officer. And so commentaries call this a acronism, which means something or someone that is not in its correct historical or chronological time, especially a thing or person that belongs to an earlier time or even a later time. That's the only way they can, they can figure this out, that maybe Moses is talking about a future time where the priests are going to approach the Lord. That could be. Or it could be we just don't know. Maybe there were priests that these young men that were offering the offer sacrifices, they were offering up sacrifices to the Lord. And so maybe they just started calling them priests. Hey, get that young man priest. We don't know. But that's my point. We don't know. You know, Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible, right? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. He wrote it. He wrote the word priest here. Yet they did not officially start till later. So it could be that Moses, as he's writing, he says, well, they're going to be priests, so I'm going to use the word priest here. You know, it could be that as he was writing that, that's what he was thinking in his mind. The first mention of the word priest was the priest Melchizedek. You remember that? In Genesis. He was a priest of the Most High God who officiated over Abraham. The first priest mention of another god was Potiphar's priest on Oen, whose daughter married Joseph, if you remember that. The third priest to be mentioned is Jethro. He was a priest of the Medes, right? So it could be there could be a tie there with Jethro, maybe. Maybe some of Jethro's priests, or maybe Jethro himself. And, and Moses could be saying, look, they need to separate themselves, clean themselves up before they approach me. The first mention of the priesthood is not until Exodus chapter 40, where God says, you shall anoint them as you anoint their father, that they may minister to me as priests, for their anointing shall surely be an everlasting priesthood throughout their generations. And, and it could be that God created this priesthood because they were familiar with Moses' father-in-law, who called himself a priest, or they, he was a priest of Midian. So they took that concept and they created priests for the children of Israel. So that's where the word priest comes from. I thought that was interesting. So Moses said to the Lord, the people cannot come up to Mount Sinai for you warned us saying, set boundaries around the mountain and consecrate it. Then the Lord said, away, get down and then come up, <laughs> you and Aaron with you. But do not let the priests and the people break through to come up to the Lord, lest he break out against them. So Moses went down to the people and spoke to them. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne room of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That is the covenant of grace that we live under today. Not like the Old Testament where God sets this boundary and says, you cannot just come up to this mountain to see me. No, 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 you have to set yourself apart. You are an unholy people. You are weak, faithless, unbelieving, and you are sinful in heart. And you must be set apart before you come 
to me. Moses will be the mediator between us while you're under this law. Then Jesus comes along. He dies on the cross. He resurrects from the dead. And those who believe in Jesus have been sanctified and set apart by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so we are already justified, just as though we've never sinned. And our justification comes through Jesus Christ's sacrifice on that cross. So now, those boundaries have been let down. And now we can come, as Hebrews 4, 16, boldly to the throne room of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace in time of need. And that is beautiful, that we can go straight to God, and speak to him himself to help us through these things, to give us strength, to give us power, to forgive us, to change us, to transform. We can do all those things right in his presence without any limitations. Where in the past, you'd have to wait. You'd have to go through a ceremony cleansing, which would take a while, a week or two, and then talk to Moses, and then see if God was ready to even receive you into the mountain, and then get close to God, and then wait for Moses then to talk to you, to go to God, to come back to you, to go to God, and back forth mediating. It's a long process before you can get help. But God is gracious, and he has given us the grace of Jesus Christ. So like the Israelites, we too must have humble reverence when we're drawing near to God, for we are sinners in the, in the presence of a holy and righteous judge. And we do. We need to remember, even today, under grace, we're supposed to have our hearts right before the Lord, too. And we are to confess our sins before we just approach Him. You know, I've learned throughout the years that oftentimes, when I have a struggle with a person, the best thing to do is to pray to God about that person. Because when you enter into God's grace, into His throne room, all of a sudden, God begins to change your heart. Because you're complaining about this person, and then God all of a sudden says, well, what about you? And you realize, oh, Lord, help me to forgive that person. Help me to move on and get beyond this and stop dwelling on this. God wants to do a work of grace in our lives, does he not? Amen. So they hear the voice of God. Wow. I want to hear the voice of God. I can't wait to get to heaven and finally hear God's voice. Even if it's just, hey, Reuben, yeah, get over here. I want to talk to you. Hey, I'm, I'm glad I'm here, Lord. <laughs> I'm sure it won't be well done, good and faithful servant. I'm far from that. But just to hear my name would be would be nice <laughs> when we get there. And we are. We're going to hear our names when we get there. And then he'll give us a new name. A new body. An everlasting life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and the encouragement tonight, Lord. May we understand, Father, the priesthood, may we understand, Lord, that we are, are people that are under boundaries, Lord, and, and we need to set those boundaries so that we don't infringe on.